So I came as well with sharing knowledge, of course, and creating new ideas because you have different people thinking differently. And also people have different skills. So complementing those skills obviously leads to stronger and better knowledge and learning. So that's, and also there's the reassurance. So you can always, if you're insecure whether you're thinking things too properly, you always have someone. So at least that you can, you know, at the same level as you, yeah. um, confirm or not. Yes. Have a dialogue. Yeah. Okay, thank you. What about the, uh, the group over here? Well, I really emphasize the communication skills that um, whether you're working on your own, but you still need to be able to communicate in the workplace with you know, others, as well as all the other points that have already been mentioned. Okay, okay. right. Thank you very much. Okay, so. So what is group learning then? So this is a, this is a, a definition of group learning, um, the activities through which individuals acquire, share and combine knowledge through experience with one another. Um, and if we look at um, why group work might be important and beneficial, um, we've got various, there are various papers here that you might like to look at which we've um, referenced. Um, but really it's the sort of things that you've already been talking about. The fact that by giving, you, by giving the students that independence that you talked about, they're actually working socially um, and um, developing those reasoning skills about their own ideas, which is one of the points that you made in the middle table, this idea that you actually, you get a, you, your beliefs are affirmed um, or your ideas are affirmed by the other person you enter into this dialogue, and that can be very um, beneficial for, for everybody. Um, we're looking at the fact that the employers are obviously asking potentially for people to um, have skills related to teamwork. I mean, obviously working in groups does, um, does nurture those, those skills. Um, better retaining of information and sort of ideas that you've been putting here but actually personalising students feeling independent, students, students feeling they've got some kind of ownership over what they're learning as well. Um, and there's this paradigm shift towards social constructivism, where um, the knowledge of the learners in the first place is being is being is being um, is being developed and is being shared, and people are actually learning from each other. And there is this concept of the social brain, which um, is some recent research in a book called Into Thinking by Neil Mercer and Karen Littleton, and it's the idea that we as human beings have a brain which depends on talking with other people and sharing ideas and we that's the way we operate in um, in contrast to a lot of the other a, a lot of all other animals in fact we're able to discuss what we might do and um, debate how we might go about something and it's that sociable um, brain which he talks about uh, they talk about in this book so that's why group work is, uh, or some of the reasons why it can be important and beneficial to your students. Um, the other thing about, sorry, about, uh, as well about creativity, and there's a sort of sense amongst people that um, people, people are often creative on their own, but actually when you look at big um, um, creative forces, like for example the Beatles, or um, the Glasgow boys, the artists, um, they, they are always groups of people where the sum was greater than parts, where they actually worked together and learned from each other and actually created something much bigger than individually they would have created. And so there are a lot of this, there's a lot of sense that actually creativity comes from working in a group and, work, and, and developing this idea of the social brain. Um, Okay, so four um, important elements in group-based learning. Um, we're going to look at this in a little while now, about what, how, when you've got students and you're going to send them off to working groups, um, how you might think about managing that. And in a moment we're going to talk about what we did with you in terms of um, <coughs> splitting you up into these rather bizarre size groups. Um, but first of all, um, they should be formed and managed in an effective way. We're going to look at group number in a moment and what might be optimal group number. 
Um, the fact that the students should be responsible for the quality of their group and individual work. The fact that you as a, as a tutor would want to be constantly making sure that you are feeding back as and when necessary. Um, but that the activities that you actually give the students aren't just about knowledge, but they are actually about promoting that whole idea of working together as a group and what makes and what how that might actually then enhance what they're learning. So what do we think the optimal group size is? And I want to just hear from you first of all on this. What um, let, let's hear from you first of all. I'm sorry you're not up on your own. It's all right. But what, what was that like? I think that actually for this kind of discussion, it was easier for me. I have, you know, I thought about something, I can put it there, I can express it immediately. Okay. When you have to immediately say what you want, you have two or three minutes. And when you have groups that are that large, so many people are contributing to the discussion, it's difficult to then summarize and um, express it in a Okay, but for you, way. you were happy just writing down your ideas and it Yes, and it that, that's in the specific context. Obviously for other purposes, obviously yeah. working in groups is much better. Okay, but for this, this one you were totally fine with it. What about being in a, in a pair? How is that? I like it in the pair. Yeah, we could share with you. And was it the case that one of you said something the other one hadn't thought about? Or, or? Yes. Yeah, I think so. Okay. So let's hear from the big group. And we wanted that to be as big as, as possible, really. What, what, what happened? We didn't say anything, anything. to begin with. Yeah. yeah. We just wanted to sort of wait for someone to say something like, I'm not saying. <laughs> Is it like you look for a leader, someone yes. to speak first to set the actual um, ethos of the group and how it would work? And, yeah. um, and then you didn't feel like everyone had an equal participation, not everyone spoke, so there wasn't sort of, you know, their quality. Yes, so you had that voice of that social interaction and that right. chance to speak. Do you think that in the time you didn't have very long, we, by the time I stopped you, I think you were talking when I stopped you, was there a sense that you'd started to get going on it, or was it still very fragmented? Not fragmented, do you think? I think I really only covered maybe one topic, yeah. maybe two. It felt, felt, like, felt like there was a sort of gestation period within the group, and we were just starting to get things yeah. moving. Some surprisingly robust discussions had already begun, but, but uh, it, was, it was the sort of... Uh, Curve, which we were suddenly just starting to go up rather yeah. than under each of What did it help? Sorry, I think it helped that we knew each other, but if we hadn't yes. met each other before, yeah. I think it would have been too short a time and they wouldn't have had some comments and some, you know, discussions had already. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, at all. It's interesting, and, and I mean, what could have happened and it didn't, but I think we've all been experiencing this where you start getting perhaps two of you might have talked to each other. To, to sort of, and, and then you get these sort of people pairing up and the sort of sense that actually the group isn't, it's just a little bit too big. So we're going to just have a quick look at um, Optimus uh, group size and actually there's a lot of sort of quite conflicting literature over it and um, I think probably it's going to be about your discipline and your students and what works best um, and what type of top type of work you're doing, whether, whether you're working, doing perhaps something um, practical in a, in a team or whether it is the sort of stuff that we've just started to look at now and talking and, and sharing ideas. Um, so um, Lachlan um, et al showed that groups of four, five, uh, three, four and five people perform better than groups of, of two in a problem solving task and that's the, that's the crucial point there I think. So maybe sharing ideas in two might be okay but a problem solving task the optimum size was three, four, and five. Um, it looked as if groups of two um, versus groups, uh, versus, uh, isn't a group obviously, but versus somebody working on their own um, according to this, uh, according to this uh, wasn't much difference between them, but I think from my own experience, I think turning around and talking to a, we certainly use this a lot when we're, when we're <coughs> working with children, having their pair partners and actually to moving around and talking to somebody else about something is a good way of articulating your own ideas and sharing them just as you have. So um, I personally don't particularly agree with that, but it's up to discussion. Um, 
Yeah, and no particular difference between 3, 4, and 5. Um, and then this was interesting, uh, the bottom? No, where's the one about the... Oh, we haven't got the one about the... Oh, right, OK. <laughs> OK, there's, there's some research, and we've got it at the end of our paper, um, which suggested that actually a group of seven was optimal. But again, it's, um, it, it's probably in terms of what type of, what type of work we're talking about. And possibly, I don't know, because I'm not, I'm not one, but possibly in perhaps an engineering setup or something where people can have very specific tasks, maybe a bigger group is more, is more feasible. Um, so, we've, I'm going to hand over to Stuart. Yes, sorry, so that, that's the end of my book. Thank you very much, Andrea. Right, so, time for group work again. Uh, as amusing as I find it having one person in the middle of the room by themselves, I think maybe splitting you all up into more equal numbers might be fair this time. So I'd like three people from the big group to join the table in the middle, please. And I'd like one other person to join this table here making two, threes, and a four, if my maths is hopefully correct. I've got the PhD in it, so I hope it is. <laughs> Excellent. Not embarrassed to start with. So we talked a little bit about why group work might be helpful. We talked a little bit about what the optimal size of the group might be. Now let's have a little think about what sort of problems can arise when working in a group. So I'd like you all to just have a chat amongst yourself, two or three minutes, some of the problems, and then we'll be back. <laughs> Right guys, how's it going over here then? Good, thank you. Any suggestions coming up so far? Yeah. Okay, so if the person's quite timid, then you might be naturally quite timid, naturally quite inconclusive, but not quite to lead, it's like to let them feel like you're a bit too fast. Yes. Yeah. Get that done and share it in the end. Perfect. Excellent. Any other ideas from this group so far? Well, it might also be challenging based on, for example, commitment that they might have as well. For example, the So the organisational part of it gets the team to actually meet in the first place. Also, sort of engagement. Maybe like like just some. Excellent. You think time's most important? 
was it right? Yes. It's very pretty, so if I may say so. Matt, how can you tell? Yeah. Okay, I think we're going to run out of time if I don't bring that to a halt so much. So, sounds like there's been some good discussion in the room. So, what are some of the problems? Can people tell me, I'd like a suggestion from each group, what you think is the biggest problem a group would face? The biggest problem that can arise? Start with, oh, I don't know, this group here, please. Um, we thought maybe relationships getting on with each other. Relationships, I mean, tensions within the group. People might like each other, people not, might, might not like each other. Yeah. Excellent. Good luck. Good. <laughs> lack of commitment or different commitments between different members of the group. Lovely, lack of commitment, brilliant. Group in the middle. I think that links well with the, I mean, different expectations as we talked about. So yep. some, of the, some of the people might just go for the best grade ever and others don't really care. Okay, so differing expectations on parts of the group members. Some people wanted to achieve very highly, yes. other people wanted to just get through and scrape by. Yeah, Perfect, thank you very much. Thank you. Well, we've got three areas that we've mainly identified, and I think they all feed in roughly what you've said. So the first one we've got, slide please, is group size. So Adrian has already discussed that. We talked about relationships within groups. Realistically, the bigger the groups are, there is probably much more chance you'll get tensions within the group. There'll be maybe factions within it. There's people who maybe like and dislike. So that kind of feeds into group size. Student disposition. Our minds work as one. Different student types. Some people are highly motivated. Some people are not highly motivated. Some people are passive, and some people are dominant. Last issue, you probably noticed that we've all gone around the room and we've all done things in a different manner. So I like to butt straight in, cut off a train of thought and start getting you to interrupt with each other and get interrupt with me. We had Asper doing a staring routine from the back so well, I was terrified. I've tried. We didn't have enough groups. So we've had Robin and we've had Adrienne walking around trying to be supportive, encouraging and listening to the tone. So actually, even though this might not be an obvious one, the facilitator can make a massive difference to a group. It can turn the group on, it can turn the group off, it can make the groups work better, it can make the groups work in a much worse fashion, it can cut off conversation dead. So actually this one is something that's well worth bearing in mind. So, let's have a little look then. Passive versus dominant students. So, Biosuria, I hope that's the way I pronounce the name, but hopefully you know what I mean anyway, interviewed a group of lecturers in 2009 that described themselves as facilitators of group work, and they identified Two types of student, passive and dominant. Really, there may be some middle ground, but in terms of creating problems within a group, passive and dominant is what we're talking about. So, <coughs> dominant students. The first one, dominant disruptive students, they glorify with a wonderful technical name of being nuisances. They are the ones, the students that stand around in groups, like to just go, oh, I don't want to do this, yada, 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 I don't really like this. And it's basically attention-seeking behaviour. The other type of disruptive student you can have, or dominant student, is highly enthusiastic. They're really into it, they really want to do well. They don't care what anyone else says because they're the only ones that matter. Pretty much like yourself. So, that is the two types of dominant students that you can have. The one that is well-intentioned and the one that is really badly intentioned. Then you've got passive students. The first type, the ones that appear lazy, disinterested, don't care. I'm only here because I've been told to be here. I don't care. Tend to avoid participation, don't like group discussions. And then you've got the quiet students that do want to work hard, but like the group over here mentioned, maybe feel uncomfortable pushing their way through four within a group situation. Maybe would rather sit back and oh, listen to other people and, and not really oh, give part of themselves across. So again, these are more of a problem than these, really, because at least these are somewhat well intentioned. So, how on earth can we talk about getting groups to work harmoniously? Well, you could allocate leadership roles to students. You could start trying to say, okay, you're working as a group, but you're going to do this, and you're going to do this, rather than let them form some sort of natural hierarchy. You can pair up students with complementary personality and skills, which is, oh, well, I'm not a big advocate of this, because I think that's somewhat difficult, especially if you're teaching a class of 100. How are you going to know which of the students have got similar personalities? It's tricky, but has been mentioned. You can talk to students at the end of a group work and say, what did you get out of the session? What happened? Did it work well? Did it not work well? What would you do if you could do it again? 
get them to really think about what they've done. And you can also talk to students on an individual basis. How is it going? How do you feel? And maybe you can pick up some problems on an individual basis that you can bring to the next session and try and rectify it in some way. Okay, so, what have we got now? Next to the slide. So we've got put donating students in charge. Okay, that, that can go well. Uh, they could go even more dominant than putting them in charge. It's a risk. It's a calculated risk. Putting them in charge of other group members may make them more inclined to listen. Or it may make them more inclined to steamroll everybody. It's a possibility. Put quiet students in charge, but for God's sake, give them some notice. Don't just say to start the session, or you, you doesn't speak, that's it, you're in charge today. That's probably not a very good idea. So giving them time to prepare there is probably a very good idea. And again, this is due to Balasuria. And finally, now this is an interesting one because we ourselves are all facilitators. I didn't really think too much about what it would be like to lead a group before doing group work. I just thought, I'll shove them in groups and I'll see what happens, and that's, that's just hope for the best. Now, there's a choice you can make before you even get to that stage. Should you be assigning roles to students? Should you be even choosing their groups? Should you be letting them naturally group up? Should you say, well, you like X, Y, and Z, and you like A, B, and C? So pair up. Rather than, ah, oh, you don't know him, but blah, get on with him, it's fine. There's a choice there to start with that maybe none of us have been thought too much about before being placed in this sort of position of power. So, so, should students choose their own groups? I asked my class this last week, and they said, yes, overwhelmingly, yes. And there is certainly evidence in the literature, according to Kagan and Kagan, that, yeah, students do like choosing their own groups. Why would you want to mess around with your peer group if you feel comfortable already? You're naturally going to work better as a team, aren't you? <coughs> well, actually, not necessarily. If you choose your collaborators, you might like them, but my mate might not be very good at group work. He might actually be quite a liability to me. So choosing him is, if I don't choose him, I'm going to make him feel silly. I'm his friend, I don't want to alienate him. But on the other hand, if he's going to be a liability in my group work, I'm making my own life harder. So actually there's some comfort in being randomised in me as a leader going, right, you can work with people you don't know, because that way your peer groups go to one side, you can all evolve into a group on your own. Okay, there's possible tensions, you may not like people, but you're in a group, you can make the best of it. And if you're not chosen your friends, but with people that you don't know who do work well, there is certainly a benefit to it. So there's already that choice before we even start talking about groups working together. Uh, Mitchell uh, did this with a group of American college students in science classes and actually he put some people in groups at the start and he let some people choose their own groups and he asked at <coughs> different stages over a 10 week period in a group work, how do you feel about group work? And those that were randomised actually said, we quite like it. And those that chose their own groups, their opinion went down as the weeks went on and they said actually no, we'd rather have been put into our own groups, we don't like this at all. Which is quite an interesting study. So, next slide. There we go. Some of the students want to be in their comfort zone. Some people don't like being in their comfort zone. Some people like pushing themselves, according to Johnson, Johnson and Hollebeck. Other people suggest that, well, it doesn't really matter how you group them. Assign them roles. That way you can take people out of their comfort zones anyway. Okay, they may know each other, but if you start telling somebody to act out of character, same sort of idea. There's that same uncomfortableness, if that is such a word, that can come along with that. Group work may not lend itself to role rotation though. Depends what sort of group work you're on. I would say in my opinion as a maths tutor, there is possibly some scope for changing around. Neil! Five minutes. Five minutes. Excellent. I thought I was hand eagerly asking you a question. I'm <laughs> gutted, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> so, to conclude then, group work's valuable. Yes. Group work can have problems. Yes. What can we do about these problems? Um, depends who you talk to, is the short answer. We've spoke for half an hour, and I've given you an idea of some of the problems, but you talk to this person, you'll say, oh, well, it's the group size. You talk to this person, oh, it's about assigning the group. You talk to somebody else, and they'll probably give you a different answer. The only thing we have conclusively learned from this is that snipers work best as a three, because one person can do the killing, one person can find the targets, and one person can find out if somebody's trying to shoot them. Otherwise, the group number is probably dependent on <laughs> your subject. So, that's us, and there's a list of more references. So, I'm quite happy, we're all quite happy to take some questions about what we've done. Thank you very much for listening. Dido. Does that mean that we should
should be thinking of our roles as teachers as sniping. I don't think I'd be sniping at them, I think it would be point blank range, but possibly yes, you, you, can, you can look at it like that. <laughs> it's an interesting concept. Yes. <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah, yeah. Non sniping related questions as well? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. I, I just sort of observations about, you know, I thought, nice presentation. Can we please use it next year for uh, setting up the groups in the PCTH? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we, we all feel like as a group that didn't know each other before we started, we, we worked together quite well. In fact, I don't think I can remember working in a group that yeah. gelled so well. But then again, I think maturity is somewhat yeah. in there. I don't think I've been paired at randomly for yeah. many years, so that could be a factor. Yeah. In, in the pre-reading, you mentioned um, dysfunctional groups. There was yeah. this, and um, you know, while you sort of talk about individual characters, did you come across anything about, you know, in the event that a group actually has a meltdown, yeah. what do you do to fix it as a facilitator? What, you know? I think as a facilitator in that situation, what would I do? I, didn't see, I must admit, I didn't read anything specific from the literature in that George yeah. okay. What would I do in that situation? Or anybody else. How to divide the group? If it's a reasonable size, you can just, for example, divide the group into two. Yeah. There was quite a lot of literature on the role of the facilitator, not necessarily strategies to manage it, but saying that you need to keep a close eye to kind of stop it getting to yeah. meltdown point. So you need to be available enough to know yeah. when to step in and when to help out and when to leave alone. So they placed a huge emphasis on the role of the facilitator. But they didn't necessarily um, say in this case do this. Yeah. Some of it, I mean I, I really enjoyed reading that and a lot of the things that applies to a lot of us as well. And also I think setting ground rules at the start, so depending on the age of the students and, and maturity of the students, but you might want to be setting ground rules in the first place so that that, that people have sort of agreed to. Yeah. You know, so we're all going to listen to each other. We're, this is what you do with children. You know, we're all going to listen to each other. We're all going to feel that our ideas aren't going to be laughed at. We're all going to feel, you know, and have a sort of set of those types of things so that hopefully that preempts yeah. the problem. Yeah. So prevention rather than cure, I suppose. Yeah. And one of the things that I've sort of run into also has to do with sort of duration of group. You, you, you talked about a group that those that had chosen their friends to work with, yeah. kind of performance declined over time, whereas those who had been randomized, it, it grew over time. Yeah. And I think there's also a function in group size. A longer and more complicated task can cope with more people, but sort of relatively confined tasks, if you have eight people yes. doing it, you know, then it, and I think we, one of the reasons we this year broke you in the learning sets into subsets was exactly because we'd had the problem of having 10 people presenting a seminar. Yeah. And, you know, it <laughs> and it depends on whether you can break the task down into, you know, so that you can keep each group as a yeah. particular task. That yeah. would make things easier. Yeah. Yeah. So 10 people presenting a half hour seminar is sort of yeah. I mean, a bit it, crazy. It seems quite natural for us.